Good evening. Welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us. Help fund the movement. Help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is episode 160. It's hard to believe we've made it all the way to episode 160, but here we are. Uh, the day is January 29th, year of our Lord, 2023, 2024, I'm sorry. Still getting used to saying 2024. Monday, January 9th, year of our Lord, 2024. Um, today, I don't have much for you. I wanted to replay, revisit uh, uh, an interview that was done on MSNBC the the day after 9-11 or in the, the, the ensuing days after 9-11 by uh, then Vice President Dick Cheney. And um, <clears throat> we can never forget, we can never forget the, the question, I think, that we, that we failed to ask then, we, we failed to ask many times in our nation's history, uh, who benefits from war? And we keep going back to it, but, but I, don't, I don't really think there's a more pressing matter than military industrial complex. You see, uh, the military industrial complex is winding up to, to, uh, March, you know, March We're we're, we're on the war path and we're on the, when we're on the war path, we find ourselves in the fog of war very quickly. Um, and once you're in the fog of war, you're in the, 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 the rule of the law of unintended consequences. And right now we are suffering the ramifications of, of many unintended consequences from past wars, uh, from past fog. Now, on either Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm going to uh, discuss a little more current events, some news, uh, some, some video clips. We're going to do that, that format again on Wednesday. We didn't do it last Wednesday because you know, the, weeks, the week that, that unfolded uh, called me to, to talk about other things, right? Uh, but we want to get back to a more news news format for this Wednesday show, and and bring in some video clips. I know the audience really likes the video clips. I, I mean, I like it too. For me, though, to be honest, I, I don't like current. I don't like the the idea of what's current. Even even the idea that's been built into the American mentality, and even the American media, and even alternative media uh, about what's current is is kind of a scam. I mean, if you think about it, the most important information that we need to revisit is often from the past, often information that we didn't necessarily understand the implications of at the time when we saw it. Maybe we were caught up in emotion. Maybe we, were, we weren't we were given all the information. Maybe we we didn't have a, a certain perspective that, that would have made us feel differently about the information uh, then uh, versus how we feel now or, or what we can see now. And that's why Per, per the the episode, I'm going back to to Dick Cheney's uh, interview with Meet the Press. But we're on the war path, and look on on Wednesday. I want to talk about Ilhan Omar. You know, I want to talk about this this idea of Somali nationalism. I want to talk a little bit about about Christina Caramo uh, and what's going on there in Michigan. As a preface, I think we're going to have Christina Caramo on the show. Um. Uh, and talk a little bit about uh, you know uh, my, my my comrade Laura Loomer and, and in the world of uh, of identity politics, many would think that or would say that it's it's disqualifying for me to even associate myself with Laura Loomer. I like Laura Loomer, you know she's got more balls than a lot of these men, uh, and and I respect that. And I and I feel I feel bad that so many women have to have to step up and and show or or. Uh, reveal their balls. No, I mean, that's that, that can be misconstrued. I'm, I'm not making a transgender pun or anything like that, but I'm, I'm just saying that there are a lot of women out there that show that they have more spine than a lot of these men. And I don't say that to affirm that, that women and men are equal or women can do what men can do or any of that type. It's just, it's just on face value, where we are today in the country, there are a lot of women who show more heart, more courage, more determination than a lot of these men. 
Uh, and that's a real indictment of men. I, I've said since the beginning of the podcast, um, the, the crisis of femininity is a failure of masculinity. And I hope to change that. So, you know, I spoke to Laura Loomer, and I know that her, her and Christina seem to be on different sides of what's going on down, uh, out there in Michigan right now. And, and I talk, I spoke with both of them, and, uh, you know, I offered my perspective. And, and I hope that they can, they can come to a better understanding. It seems like there's two very different stories, as often, often you would expect in the world of politics, especially a country away from one another. Um, but, but I value both of their contributions to the, to the movement. I really do. Uh, and I think them both to be genuine. Now, here, here's the issue. We are going to go through a sequence of events where, where purity and litmus tests could be what breaks the back of this movement. You could look at Christina Caramo and say, oh, she's just a DEI hire. Oh, she just was, was uh, elected or, or the value is that she's a black woman. No, and there's some value to that because she's the, the, the chair of, of the Republican Party in a densely black populated greater metropolitan area. It, it, it is what it is. Um, but more importantly than that, she's, she stood the line on, on a number of issues that I think are integral to the America First position. And those issues, like I said over the last couple of weeks, is really three issues. Uh, the debt, the border, and the forever wars. Those are our three issues. The Democrats' three issues are social equity, uh, democracy, and environmentalism. Social justice, social equity, environmentalism, and democracy. And in democracy, like I said last episode, this whole post-World War II democratic liberal order is really the, the, the cornerstone of the entire scam and, and, and this idea that we're, we're defending the rules-based order. Anybody who says rules-based order, just go fuck yourself. Right out of the gate, you go, you go right on ahead. Uh, uh, you know, take that, take that, that, uh, that, take that, that spoonful of of bullshit. You you turn it sideways and you jam it straight up your ass, because the rules based order is and may have always been a scam. But whether or not it was whether or not it was intended to be a scam, it's certainly a scam now. And the number one way we can see the scam is right there at the southern border. We're talking about the rules-based order and, 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 and protecting territorial integrity of all these other countries. Even now, Somalia, okay, Ilhan Omar wants us to defend uh, Somalia's uh, uh, territorial integrity, fight for Somalia's territorial integrity, but not our own. Okay, so the rules-based order is out right there on that basis alone. The Democrats think you're so stupid, you'll believe they're trying to protect or fight for a rules-based order all around the world except for here in our own country. It's a scam. Now, <clears throat> back to Christina, um, election integrity, supporting Donald Trump, supporting the MAGA movement. Uh, she, she's been steadfast on these issues, so much so that The Guardian, which is really, you know, I mean, it doesn't get more, uh, more establishment than The Guardian coming right out of the the belly of the beast there in, in Langley. Um, Axios is the real head of the New World Order. Uh, the Guardian is is the mouthpiece, right? Uh, so when The Guardian goes after Christina Caramo and says uh, she's a conspiracy theorist, she's peddling conspiracy theories, she's a, uh, you know, a, a person who has uh, extreme political views, I just see myself. And I see myself not because she's black. I see myself because we're America firsters. Those ideas are America firsters. And I said before, we have to separate out the ideas from the individual because the ideas stand on their own merit. And Christina Caramo, no different than Donald Trump, no different than Martin Luther King, no different than Thomas Jefferson or Malcolm X or Ben Franklin or the list goes on and on and on. Ideas stand on their own merit regardless of the individual. And the same could be said for Laura Loomer. I mean, Laura Loomer is often attacked for being a conspiracy theorist or being an extremist or being toxic to the party or the movement or divisive or whatever the fuck, you know, they want to say. Um, fine, so be it. What I will say is this. It seems very clear to me from my own experience right now within the Minnesota GOP, which I'm going to have two guests on who are experiencing, experience, oh, I'm sorry, I got a little bit of a cough here still, experiencing uh, uh, an unconstitutional, and when I say unconstitutional, I mean by the Republican Party's constitution, 
uh, a sort of unconstitutional, hostile takeover of of the Senate district, uh, the Senate district, which they sit on the executive committee of. And basically, you had a bunch of establishment rhinos <coughs> who were voted out uh, in 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 effect uh, or, or resigned from the party because of the MAGA energy, the gr- the swell of the MAGA energy in the in, in, in the grassroots of this party, even here in Minnesota, which is supposed to be this super liberal or rhino state. In many ways, it is, but but there is a groundswell of MAGA um, MAGA energy. And in this particular Senate district, these these people basically uh, threw off the old guard. The old guard waited. But it seems they waited in the weeds. They, they laid in the weeds, waited for their moment to strike back. Now they've struck back. And they basically said, look, we're going to do what we want to do, regardless of the rules, regardless of the process, regardless of, of, of uh, who is formally recognized as, as the executive committee or as party officers or, or, or so on and so forth. Much of what I see is taking place here in the Michigan GOP. And that's regardless of whether or not Christine, uh, the, the things that have been uh, uh, alleged against Christina Caramo are true or not. What, what seems to be very, very obvious is that somebody has made the decision to, to circumvent the process of, of we the people there in the, Min- the Michigan uh, GOP. I'm sorry, excuse me, not the Minnesota GOP, but it's happening in the Minnesota GOP too. And I want to send a very, very clear warning to, to President Donald Trump. Um, watch. Watch for the, 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 the wolves in the hen house. The wolves that come out, the, the wolves that come from the outside uh, will, will most likely be, be somewhat easy to spot. The wolves that are already inside are going to be the ones that are most difficult to see. And that's, I mean, it, it, look, Donald Trump has, I'm sure, his hands full three ways to, to Sunday, <coughs> 10 ways to Sunday, 100 ways to Sunday in that respect. No shortage of trust and distrust that's taken place uh, in, in his camp, uh, especially over the last four years and, and what he's experienced with people saying that they're supportive, saying they're America first, and then, and then turning on them uh, when, when it counts the most. Uh, Hutchinson uh, is, a, is a great example of that. And she's another uh, mealy mouth, posh, a white liberal Me Too scam artist who was very, very close. Uh, I'm not saying she was close to the president, but she was inside the camp, right? Probably saying all the right things, you know, saying she supported this. It's, everybody can say what they support. What I'm, what I'm saying is Christina Caramo has put it on the line. Not only did she organize a grassroots movement, based on MAGA ideas, she was able to thwart the GOP establishment with that campaign and with the precinct strategy. And she remains one of the single greatest examples of the efficacy in the precinct strategy anywhere in the country. And for that reason, we have to be very, very skeptical uh, uh, to, to, to throw her uh, out of the movement without, without due process, without our own individual due process of, of investigation. Um, and, you know, again, Michigan, big swing state, a lot on the line in Michigan. We know the deep, the deep state will compartmentalize uh, all of these various outposts of, of, of people because what they have that we lack is organization, and they're highly organized. And, and we lack that sort of unilateral organization for better or for worse, for better and for worse. So there's a storm brewing there in the Michigan GOP, but I, I get the sense that it's a storm brewing all across the country where, where <coughs> the RNC, the old guard Republican establishment, the same ones who, in effect, sent word to Carrie Lake that, that they wanted her to stand down for the Senate committee, the, the, the establishment is, is very good at absorbing contact. Politics is a contact sport. And the establishment, the, the deep state, the administrative state, all of these, these unilateral these unilateral groups, these cabals, these sort of cadres of corruption, all of them are very, very good at absorbing contact. And right now the contact is, is you, the American people. You, the American people, have had a belly full of it. You, the American people, have spoken. You and the Republican 
party, the, the delegate body so far has spoken that that Donald Trump is is the guy. That's who we're going to put our, our our support behind for 2024, regardless of these indictments, regardless of, of all of the, the 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 newly waged lawfare or propaganda, way uh, you know uh, coming coming uh, against him. The people will decide for better or for worse, for better and for worse. And right now, our choice is Donald Trump. Now, what the establishment is going to do in response is they're going to concede that we have to support Donald Trump. Of course, that's why the RNC came out and said, uh, we want to, we want to, you know, force major uh, Donald Trump to, to be the, the, the candidate, the endorsed candidate. And they can make it seem like they want to circumvent all of this, this wasted energy uh, to, to support Donald Trump and, and unify the party. And some of that may be true. I'm not saying that there aren't people within the Republican Party that genuinely believe that, that unifying behind Donald Trump is the most strategic thing to do, even if they disagree with many of our America first ideas. I'm not saying that that's the case, because I, I, would, I would venture to guess there are a lot of people who look at elections from such a material standpoint, meaning a results standpoint, um, that that they would they would they would uh, they would endorse uh, Donald Trump uh, to to presumably unify the party to stop with any uh, you know any waste of of resources. I get that mentality, so I'm not saying that's not out there. But there's the flip side of that coin, and we all we we all have to be <coughs> conscious. Of, of this dichotomy. The flip side of the coin is there are people out there who want to save face with a potential future constituency being you, the American people, the working class, you, the little guy who's had a belly full of it, who supports Donald Trump based on the ideas. There are people within the establishment, within the, the, uh, within the system, within the structure of the Republican Party that need to save face for future agendas, for future opportunity. And so to save face, yeah, we'll endorse Donald Trump. But behind the scenes, down the ticket, and in the, in the GOPs all across the country, America first is persona non grata. And the real America first is now you'll have an entire crop of, of Republicans like Tom Emmer who come out and, and will say, I support Donald Trump. I'm MAGA because he feels he has to, because he's afraid of the constituency right there in CD6. Now, does Tom Emmer maybe align with some MAGA ideas? Possibly. But what does his record show? Tom Emmer's record shows that when push comes to shove, regardless of what he believes deep down in his heart, what he's willing to stand on is the status quo. What Christina Caramo has shown is that what she's willing to stand on are the ideas and the principle. Whether it's China, whether it's globalism, whether it's the elections, so on and so forth. Laura Loomer as well. Laura Loomer has done, Laura Loomer has done much of the same. Uh, so we hope that they find some, some common ground. Maybe I could facilitate that. I'm not sure. But I'm very, very interested in what's going on in the Michigan GOP. Because right now, as it stands, the Michigan GOP is one of the few places all across the country where grassroots energy was able to bubble up and, and oust the Republican leadership there in the party. And that's, that is such an important, such an important step in 2024. <coughs> Regardless of anything else, we need change over in the RNC. And a lot of these RNC members are going to try and change their tune now and support Donald Trump because they see they see you over the horizon. They they hear the drums of war. They know the war room posse is coming. They can hear you. They know that you know the difference between America first and these feckless rhino neocon uh, uh, you know puppets <coughs> who got their start right there with the Bushes and Cheney. Who got their start right there with Daddy Bush? Who even got their start? right there with Ronald Reagan, the Mujahideen. And I keep going back to it because a lot of you believe that, that, you know, Ronald Reagan is some saint of the Republican Party and there are great things, you know, there are many great things he did, of course. 
the things that I agree with, things that I loved. Ronald Reagan was a lovable guy. He was very charismatic. And in that way, his charisma was able to, to, to bring together a sort of a, a unity or a consensus about his policy uh, that may be somewhat undeserving when you really go back with a fine tooth comb. We got to be open to all of this. This, this American citizenship isn't for play. This, this is not a game. This isn't some, some beauty pageant or, or, or popularity contest. I mean, I know the way our elections work is it kind of is a popularity contest and it kind of is about money, but, but the integrity and sacred honor of the American people need to understand and commit themselves to, to, to not allowing it to become a full-blown spectacle of, of, of political theater. Because if it does, there's no use in being involved in the process. Fine tooth comb, intellectual rigor. Look into it. Look into what Laura Loomer is saying. Look into what Christina Caramo is responding with. No need to pick a side. Let's just look at the information. I want to have both of them on. I told Laura, I said, I want to have you on the show ASAP. I don't even know if she can be on YouTube. That's how censored Laura Loomer is. Um, Going to have Christina Caramo on the show. Maybe I can get them both on the show at the same time. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but this is a very important moment, and this is a no-bullshit moment in American history. All this shit needs to be taken serious. And the Michigan GOP is about as serious of, as, as, of an issue as we could possibly have. And, and, and I just like I said about Nikki Haley, Pete Hoekstra, don't know him. Maybe he's a good guy. Maybe he's America first. Maybe he means well. When I look into him and I see that he was ambassador to the Netherlands, the, the UN ambassador to the Netherlands, my flags go up. Same way they go up about Nikki Haley. Because the United Nations is a fucking scam. And so the people who opt to ambassador for it, I have to wonder, are they the controlled opposition? Are they the Trojan horse? <coughs> and I look into Pete Hoekstra's time as a congressman, and I see uh, that, that he was in support of the Patriot Act. He was su in support of, of NAFTA. Uh, he was in support of a, a, a number of things that, that are very concerning. Very, very concerning. Now, he's not, he's not the sum total of all his mistakes either. We have to have that discernment. And we have to have the composure, the, the, the mental maturity to not, to not rush to a conclusion because of the desperate situation we've put ourselves in as citizens in this country. It's only going to make matters worse. You see it all the time in movies and films and stories that are depicted when, when, when a, a, a main character is put in a crisis and, and all of a sudden he starts to, or he or she starts to make rash decisions um, based on partial information. <coughs> and it ends up being a, 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 a domino effect to their own demise. We have to slow that process down. We have to slow the process down of, of quick decisions. Um, now there are some people out there that I, that I wouldn't say the same for Nikki Haley's one of them. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't need to do a, 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 a three times, four times over on Nikki Haley. I've heard her speak enough. I know what she's pitching. I know what she's willing to double down. I know what she's standing on today, let alone what she stood on in the past. And, and I'm not in alignment with that. Am I saying Nikki Haley is, is irredeemable? Maybe for me personally, but as a person, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a politician, as no. No, you, I mean, you know, they say that I was telling one of my young, young men this, that I, that I help in basketball. Um, they say you can't become a new person overnight, right? It's hard to become uh, a, a new man overnight. And it is damn hard, but it's not impossible. And usually, usually the only times that, the only times the, the, the anomalies where a person does change their ways overnight comes through that crisis. And I remember when me and A.J. Barker a few episodes back were, were talking about how most people will default to their bad habits in times of crisis. And that's true. But the anomalies where people do change their life most often come through crisis at the same. Both things are true. When most people encounter crisis, they default back to their, their bad habits. But the few times where people are able to transcend uh, the, 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 the bad habits that exist in them, the, the general spirit of how they've lived is through 
life-threatening situations. And we're facing a life-threatening situation here as a nation. And as a consequence, many people are, are facing what you could could you, you what you could describe as life threatening situations individually? Our freedom is at stake. Our freedom is on the line. I certainly feel that way. I mean, it, it's been a lot of what's pushed me into politics. I didn't have to do politics. You know, I got debt. I got family court issues. I, I could have easily taken six hundred thousand dollars from from uh, you know the CBA, the Chinese Basketball Association, and solved all my debt issues. Solved all my money issues. Lived good. Live good over in China. <clears throat> Live like a king. They treat their basketball players like kings in China. And in other places too, or, or, you know, around the world. I was offered to play in Japan. I was offered to play in Taiwan. I was offered to play in, in, in South Korea. All of countries I, I don't trust. I don't support. I don't support China. I don't support the CCP. So I'm not going to play for you. If I'm going to play basketball, I'm going to play basketball under an organization that, that I have some shared values with. I'm going to play basketball in communities where, where when I go out and, and, and give my blood, sweat, and tears, it, it, it means something. It means something to the people who watch. But that's just me. That's just me. You know, you, you get to make the decision for yourself. My point is, to, to end, and then we'll get into the Dick Cheney Meet the Press interview, my point here is, the litmus test and the purity test are, are uh, a double-edged sword. We have to be swift with, with, our, with our discernment of who we can trust and who we can't, but we also have to be cautious. We have to be conscious and cautious uh, about snap time decisions that could be the domino effect that, that, that leads to our demise. Not easy. What I'm asking you to do isn't easy. But if it was easy, everybody would do it. If it was easy, everybody would save the country. If it was easy, everybody would be the MAGA movement. If it was easy, everybody would be Donald Trump. It ain't easy. It's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. You shouldn't want it to be easy. Because if it's easy, it's probably not worth anything. So the, what we've been charged to do now as American citizens is going to be hard. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, and we're going to make mistakes. <laughs> People are going to make mistakes. But if, we, if we're willing to look at things objectively with truth, step back and, and really, really analyze what's going on, I think we can do it. I honestly think we can do it. I talk a lot of doom and gloom on the podcast. Last episode, I had a clip go viral because I motherfucked uh, you know, the, the, the audience. And, and there is some motherfucking that's needed. That, that's a part of what we need sometimes. But if I'm being honest, I'm optimistic. I really am. I really am optimistic about, about where we are in this country. Because I look out, I see people like Steve Bannon, I see people like, like Laura Loomer, I see people like Christina Caramo, I see people like Carrie Lake, I see people like Trent Staggs, I see people like Lieutenant Governor uh, 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 Thompson, <coughs> Winsome Sears. You know, I, I see all these people. I see the people there in the city of Chicago who are building up their own sort of, uh, 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 you know, uh, grassroots rebellion against the, the feckless policies of the Joe Biden administration in this border invasion. So I see signs to, to be hopeful. Tough road ahead. Tough road ahead, and, and, and we'll see how it shakes out. So in the, in the next couple of weeks, you can expect potentially a Christina Caramo, Laura Loomer. Uh, I want to have the, the two um, Republican Party officers from Minnesota uh, on the show to, to tell us their story about how some of these inter-party politics work at the state level <coughs> and even at the, the more local level, which are Senate districts, congressional districts, and BPOUs and whatnot. Something you need to know anyway going into February because we got caucuses coming here in Minnesota in February and a, a lot of different places around the country. So that's going to be important. Um, that's it for me today. Uh, Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney on Meet the Press days after the 9-11 attack, and he basically lays out a, a, a very succinct um, idea, a very succinct battle plan on how we would get caught up in, a, in two forever wars there in the Middle East. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you'll, you'll be able to make out the dishonesty in, in, in this hour-long interview. 
Is there some truth in it? Are there some things that Dick Cheney said that were, that were categorically true? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the greatest lies, the greatest schemes always come with a little bit of truth. And that's what makes it, that's what's making, that's what makes discernment so difficult. Satan isn't going to just play in, in lies. Satan isn't, Satan isn't going to just play in the realm of, of, of deceit. I'm sorry. He's not going to play in, in, uh, you know, uh, objective, objective lies. He's going to use, he's going to use the truth. He's going to use the truth to try and corrupt you. A truth. Right. And, and just like there is a, a hierarchy of, of, of divinity, there's a hierarchy of truth. There are levels to truth uh, or there is a depth to truth, you could say. And, and what we try to do on this show is we try to find the deepest truth uh, that we can. We try to mine out the deepest truth, that, that universal truth that's in there or as close as we can get. Because it's my belief that's the, that's the truth that's closest to God. <clears throat> and if we can find that, we'll be well equipped to deal with all other deceit. But you get to make that decision for yourself in your own life. Nobody's telling you how to think. I'm just providing options. I'll see you on Wednesday night, uh, potentially Tuesday night. We'll see. Uh, watch, the Royce White, uh, watch the Royce White show premiering on February 3rd uh, with Real America's Voice. Go to Royce White USA YouTube channel and get ready to uh, listen to the playbacks of the Royce White radio show now airing Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern on the John Fredericks Radio Network. Uh, that's been a blast. Loving, loving using the music. I think we're going to try and find a way to use the music here on YouTube or maybe on Rumble so, so you can get the full experience of the radio show. Music really has a way of, of, of breaking up the, the conversation and, and, and uh, um, and invoking certain emotion. You know, music has an emotional power to it. Can be very valuable when used for good. I'll tell you that. It's my opinion. Um, we'll see you later on this week. We appreciate your viewership and listenership today and in the future. Hope I didn't take too much of your time in this intro. Um, I hope you, 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 <coughs> you stick around for the Dick Cheney interview uh, so you can get a real, a real up close and personal look of uh, a reminder. Of, of what a, a true neocon looks like. Um, the fight continues. Don't die a jerk off. And as always, Godspeed. Live from Camp David, a special edition of Meet the Press with Tim Russert. An exclusive interview with Vice President Dick Cheney. And we are at Green Top in the shadows of the presidential retreat at Camp David. Mr. Vice President, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Tim. This is the first television program to originate from here, which underscores the seriousness of our discussion this morning. The president, the vice president, the national security team have been meeting for the last 36 hours. What can you share with the American people this morning? Well, Tim, this is the first chance we've had really since the events this week to sit down and really focus on uh, on uh, various plans and propositions, things we ought to be doing going forward. Up till now, it's been focused very much on trying to manage the crisis and uh, to deal with the problems of the immediate uh, situation. But uh, yesterday, we've been able to come up and, and get everybody together. A lot of work done, staff work done in, in preparation for it, and sit down and really spend some time looking at what our strategy ought to be and how we ought to proceed. When the president went to the World Trade Center on Friday, he said, the people who did this will hear from all of us soon. There's an expectation in the country that we're about to pay back big time quickly. Mm -hmm. What should the people, American people think or feel about that? I think the important thing here, Tim, is for people to understand that, that um, you know, things have changed since last Tuesday. The world shifted in some respects. Clearly what we're faced with here is a situation where uh, terrorism has struck home in the United States. We've been subject to uh, targets of terrorist attacks before, especially overseas with our forces and, and American personnel overseas. But this time, because of what happened in New York and what happened in Washington, it's, um, uh, it's a qualitatively different set of circumstances. It's also important for people to understand that this is a long-term proposition. It's not like uh, 
well, even Desert Storm, where we had a buildup for a few months, four days of combat, and it was over with. Uh, this is going to be the, the kind of work that will probably take years because the, the focus has to be not just on one, any one individual. The, the problem here is terrorism. And even in this particular instance, uh, it looks as though the responsible organization was uh, a group called Al-Qaeda. It's, a, um, it's Arabic for the base. That's Osama bin Laden. He headed it up and, uh, and organized it, but it's a very broad, kind of loose uh, coalition of, of uh, groupings. It includes not only uh, his forces, but it also includes, for example, Islamic uh, Jihad from Egypt. It includes uh, a movement from Uzbekistan. Uh, the groups that are terrorist organizations, people that oftentimes move around them, sometimes share common ideologies that uh, operate on a worldwide basis. And uh, what we have to do is take down those networks of terrorist organizations. And as I say, I think this is going to be a, a struggle that the United States is going to be involved in for the foreseeable future. There's not going to be an end date when we can say, there, it's all over with. Uh, it's going to require constant vig vigilance on our part to avoid problems in the future. But it's also going to require a, a major effort and obviously quite possibly use of military force. Do you believe that anyone who participated in the events on Tuesday, or in fact in a, even a support role, or on a plane that wasn't successfully hijacked. Are they still at large in the United States? We don't know. The, the possibility clearly exists that there could be additional uh, terrorists out there that were part of this operation that maybe got cold feet and uh, didn't get on the airplane uh, or for one reason or another were thwarted in their efforts. Uh, we have to assume that possibility exists. We had these uh, 19 individuals in the United States, uh, some of them for several years, training, preparing, getting uh, ready for this operation. And uh, we can by no means assume now that that's all there is. There may well be other operations uh, that have been planned and, and are, in fact, in the works. When the president said, everyone in uniform, get ready, did that, does that suggest a massive call-up call of reserves? We've had some reserve call-up. We called up, of course, 35,000 reservists. Uh, we felt that was important to do here. I think the, the way to think about it, Tim, is to think about uh, the target and what our, our objectives are here. Obviously, we're interested in individuals who were directly involved in planning, coordinating, ordering the attack. And, uh, but those tend to be individuals or small groupings of individuals, cells perhaps, uh, various places around the world. We need to go uh, find them and root them out. And, uh, but we also, what's different here, what's changed in terms of U.S. policy is the president's determination to also go after those nations and organizations and people that lend support to these terrorist operators. Um, if you've got a nation out there now that has provided uh, a base, uh, training facilities, a sanctuary, uh, as has been true, for example, in this case, probably with Afghanistan, uh, then they have to understand, and others like them around the world have to understand, that if you provide sanctuary to terrorists, you face the full wrath of the United States of America, and uh, that we will, in fact, uh, aggressively go after these nations to make certain that they cease and desist from providing support for these kinds of organizations. Full wrath. That's a very strong statement to it the Afghans indeed. this morning. It is indeed. The president said that Osama bin Laden was the prime suspect. Why? There's uh, just a lot of evidence to link uh, his organization, uh, the Al-Qaeda organization, and he's the head of, of Al-Qaeda to this operation. Uh, there's some ties, for example, to some of the people involved here back to the USS Cole bombing uh, in Yemen. Uh, we're able to tell, going back now, looking at uh, relationships and, and the way they've operated in the past, uh, we're uh, quite confident that, in fact, uh, as the President said, he is the prime suspect. That doesn't mean we know all there is to know yet. That doesn't mean there weren't others involved. As, as uh, I mentioned, uh, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad has a very close working relationship with uh, this organization. So there may well be others. We want to continue to investigate aggressively to make sure we've wrapped up and, and understand fully all who were involved. But uh, clearly the, the evidence at this point um, takes us very much in that direction. You have no doubt that Osama bin Laden played some role in this? I have no doubt that uh, he and his organization uh, played a significant role in this. Were you surprised by the precision and sophistication of the operation? Uh, well, certainly we were surprised in the sense that um, you know, there had been uh, information coming in that a big operation was planned, but that's sort of a trend that you see all the time in these kinds of reports. But we did no specific th threat. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving uh, what happened, obviously, you know, the cities, uh, airliner, and so forth. We did uh, 
go on alert with our overseas forces a number of times during the course of the summer when we thought uh, the threat level had risen significantly. So clearly we were surprised uh, by what happened here. On the other hand, in terms of the sophistication of it, it's interesting to, to look at because clearly what happened is you, you got um, some people committed to, uh, to die in the course of the operation. You got them visas, you got them entered to the United States. They came here, some of them enrolled in our commercial aviation schools and learned to fly. Uh, courtesy of, of uh, our own capabilities here in the United States. Then uh, what they needed in order to execute was some degree of coordination, obviously, in terms of timing. Uh, but uh, they needed uh, knives, uh, cardboard cutters, uh, razor blades, whatever it was, and, and an airline ticket. And that's it. They then were able to take over the aircraft and use our own, you know, heavily loaded with fuel uh, large aircraft. To take Intentionally to choosing them. planes that had lots of fuel and a few passengers. It certainly looks that way. And um, the, uh, so the sophisticated, in, on the one hand, it's very simple. It doesn't involve a lot of hardware or complex uh, devices that they have to bring into the United States. They, in effect, turn some of our own system against us. Um, but its, uh, it's uh, simplicity uh, does, in fact, also speak volumes in terms of planning, creativity, uh, ingenuity in terms of how they go about uh, these kinds of operations. We clearly will have to revisit our visa procedures. We've got to look at, at all aspects of uh, the operation here in terms of what happened. Uh, clearly there are going to be a lot of lessons to be learned from it. Um, but it's important for us, too, not to get trapped into thinking uh, if we just guard against another situation where terrorists can hijack airplanes and use them to hit vital targets in the U.S. that we've dealt with the problem. Uh, I'm sure they're out there right now thinking about new creative ways to, to come after us that uh, don't involve any of those, uh, those techniques at all. It's something totally new. Osama bin Laden released a training video, 100 minutes long, which was obtained by the Western media this summer. And I want to show a portion of that to you and give you a chance to respond to it. And we'll play it right now. Uh, these are followers of his chanting. We have to fight every day, even to the shedding of blood in God's righteous path. There he is himself uh, with his own rifle. They go on to say, We thank God for granting us victory the day we destroyed the coal in the sea. That's a USS destroyer that was hit last year. Those are his supporters marching. There you are, as Secretary of Defense visiting Saudi Arabia, used in this video to rally support for Osama bin Laden. And bin Laden himself, we have to practice the way of the suicidal commandos of faith and the heroism of the resistance fighter and ref refuse their culture and we will take advantage of their misfortunes and the blood of their wounded. He goes on to Mr. S uh, say, Mr. Secretary, that with small capabilities we can defeat the U.S. America is much weaker than it appears. What's your message this morning to Osama bin Laden? Well, I, uh, I think he seriously misreads the American people. <clears throat> I think the, um, I mean, the, the, you have to ask yourself why somebody would do what he does. Why is someone so motivated? Obviously, he's filled with hate for the United States and for everything we stand for. Why? Freedom and democracy. Why does he hate us so much? It must have something to do with his background, uh, his own uh, uh, upbringing. He's uh, the... Uh, son of a prominent Saudi family, successful business uh, uh, group uh, with significant wealth. He went and served in Afghanistan uh, with the Mujahideen during the uh, war against uh, the Russians. And um, he has, uh, for whatever reason, uh, developed this intense hatred of everything that uh, relates to the United States. And his objective, obviously, is to try to influence our behavior to uh, force us uh, to withdraw from that part of the world. And uh, clearly, he's not going to be successful. Uh, he has stated unequivocally that he wants the United States out of the Middle East. He no longer wants to, the United States to be the ally of Israel. Mm -hmm. Will our relationship with Israel change in any way, shape, or form because of this event? No. The uh, fact of the matter is that um, the uh, will not allow him to uh, achieve his aims. Uh, we're not about to uh, change our policies or change our basic fundamental beliefs. Uh, what we are going to do is aggressively go after Mr. Bin Laden, obviously, and all of his associates. And uh, even if it takes a long time, uh, I'm convinced eventually we'll prevail. There is an FBI wanted poster, and there he is himself, uh, wanted for the murder of U.S. nationals outside the United States. He's in, under indictment for his involvement in blowing up embassies in Tanzania and Kenya. Mm -hmm. Could we say to the Afghanistan government, you are harbor harboring a fugitive from justice, give him over in 48 hours, or we're coming in and taking him? Uh, we could say such a thing. Legally? 
Well, legally, certainly. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> I'll simply restate again, Tim, I don't want to get into the business of predicting what specific steps uh, we will take, but uh, without question, uh, the President has been very, very clear that uh, to harbor terrorists uh, is to, uh, in effect, accept a certain degree of guilt for the acts that they, uh, that they uh, commit. And uh, the uh, government of Afghanistan uh, has to understand that uh, we believe they have indeed been harboring uh, a man who committed, uh, whose organization committed uh, this most recent egregious act. You're convinced and, uh, he's still in Afghanistan? We don't know. Is there any international law or United States law which would prohibit us from killing him if we found him? Um, not in my estimation, Tim. Um, but uh, I'd have to check with the lawyers on that, obviously. You've got to, lawyers always have a role to play. But it, one of the intriguing things here is the way in which um, people have rallied around, other governments have rallied around uh, this notion that, in fact, this is a war. We've seen uh, our NATO allies for the first time in history invoke Article 5. Uh, an attack against one is an attack against all. It's never before been done. They unanimously agreed to that proposition uh, earlier this week in, in uh, Brussels. Um, I think the world increasingly will understand that what we have here are a group of barbarians, that they threaten all of us, that uh, the U.S. is the target of the moment. But um, uh, one of the things to remember is if you look at the roster of countries who lost people in the bombing in New York, uh, over 40 countries uh, have had someone killed or have uh, significant numbers missing. The British, for example, uh, have uh, an estimated 100 dead and five to 700 still missing. So it's, uh, it's an attack just upon, not just upon the United States, but upon uh, on, um, you know, civilized society. A very important country in all this is Pakistan, on the border of Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan, uh, there are reports on the wires today, has sent a delegation to the Taliban government in Afghanistan saying it's time to turn Osama bin Laden over. The Pakistan government is also saying to its people this morning, we will get more aid from the United States. The United States will lift economic sanctions against us. And we've been given assurances that the Indian government and the Israeli government will not be part of any military operation based in Pakistan. Can you confirm that? Um, I've seen uh, some communication back and forth at this point. Let me, uh, let me simply say we have had uh, discussions with the PACs. Uh, President uh, Bush called uh, President Musharraf just yesterday afternoon from Camp David. Uh, they've had a good conversation. Uh, we have made certain requests of, uh, of the Pakistanis. They have agreed uh, to work with us in this endeavor, and, and uh, some of that's covered in the uh, statement they've made there. They will get more assistance from us. Well, we'd like to, uh, to be able to work with them. We've got to remember Pakistan's been a close friend and ally of the United States in the past. Uh, the relationship's been somewhat strained in recent years, primarily because congressionally imposed sanctions uh, have had an adverse effect, clearly, on the relationship. And uh, those sanctions were imposed as the Pakistanis developed nuclear weapons. But uh, we're clearly in a situation here where that relationship is important. It's important to us. It's important to Pakistan. Pakistan borders Afghanistan. They are uh, one of only three countries that have uh, diplomatic relations with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, they can be very helpful in this case, and uh, we expect they will be. And there's nothing wrong with providing economic rewards for helpful behavior. No, I think you're going to want both the carrot and the stick approach. Pakistan also has a nuclear capability. How dangerous is it for that government to come out against Osama bin Laden or be helpful to the United States? Are we concerned about destabilizing Pakistan with nuclear capability, a capability that could fall in the hands of the Taliban or Osama bin Laden? Well, we're, uh, we're clearly very sensitive to those kinds of, uh, of uh, problems. Anytime you're dealing in that part of the world, in the Middle East, uh, the potential for instability always exists. You're going to have a change in government in relatively short notice, and, and uh, we're, we're well aware of all that. But it also, it's, it's one of the reasons, frankly, uh, you'll see uh, the Al-Qaeda organization, Osama bin Laden, choosing to locate in that part of the world because it is an area of instability, because there are places that nobody really controls. And um, those are the areas we're going to have to operate in if we're going to be successful. And again, uh, the, the key here to keep in mind is that what we're asking nations to do, and which the PACs have clearly made a decision to do, is we're asking nations to do step up and be counted. They're going to have to decide. Are they going to be stand with the United States and believe in freedom and democracy and civilization, or are they going to stand with the terrorists and the barbarians, if you will? 
And uh, it's a fairly clear-cut choice, and I'm delighted to see that Pakistan has, in fact, uh, stepped up to the task. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, three critical countries in the Middle East who have been somewhat supportive of the United States. They also have segments of their population that look at Osama bin Laden as a hero. If we demand that they support us, do we risk destabilizing those governments? No, I think uh, you've got to recognize, from the standpoint of the Saudis, for example, they're a prime target uh, for uh, this organization of terrorists, uh, Osama bin Laden. He uh, adamantly opposes the uh, Saudi royal family. Um, uh, probably second only to the United States would be his, uh, his hatred for, uh, uh, for the current government in Saudi Arabia. Uh, with respect to Egypt, for example, and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, uh, the, these are groups and organizations that have threatened the government of Egypt in the past. Uh, President Mubarak has been the target of several assassination attempts during the course of his career, some of them promulgated by these kinds of groups and organizations. So I think uh, uh, governments, friends of the United States, uh, the governments you mentioned, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, etc., they understand uh, very clearly that uh, it's as much in their interest as it is in ours that we uh, end these kinds of uh, activities and that we, uh, we put a stop to this kind of international terrorism. And uh, I think they'll be prepared to help us. Mr. Vice President, how difficult and delicate is it to send this message that we're going to uproot terrorism in Osama bin Laden and some other cells, but that this is not a war against Islam and not a war against all Arab people? We have to continually remind uh, folks of that. The president's been very clear, and uh, it would be a, a huge mistake for we as Americans to assume that this uh, represents some kind of, uh, or, or should lead us to, to some kind of condemnation of, of Islam. That's clearly not the case. Uh, this is a perversion, if you will, of uh, um, some of these religious beliefs by an extremist group. We have extremists associated with you know, every imaginable religion in the world. Um, but uh, this is by no means a, a war against Islam. Uh, we've got a great many Arab Americans, for example, who are first-class, loyal American citizens. We need to make certain that we don't uh, make the mistake of assuming that everybody who uh, comes from a certain ethnic group or a certain religious background is somehow to be blamed for this. Clearly, that's not the case. Uh, they are as appalled by it as we are. When Osama bin Laden uh, took responsibility for blowing up the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, U.S. embassies, several hundred died, the United States launched 60 Tomahawk missiles into his training sites in Afghanistan. It only emboldened him. It only inspired him and seemed even to increase his recruitment. Is it safe to say that that kind of response is not something we're considering in that kind of minute magnitude? Uh, I'm, I want to be careful here, Tim, because I clearly... Um would be inappropriate for me to talk about operational matters, um, specific uh, options or, or uh, the kinds of activities we might undertake going forward. Uh, we do indeed, though, have, obviously, uh, the world's finest military. They've got uh, a broad range of capabilities. Um, and uh, they may well uh, be given missions in connection with this overall task and strategy. We also have to work though sort of the, the dark side, if you will. We've got to spend time in the shadows and in the intelligence world. Uh, a lot of what needs to be done here will uh, have to be done quietly without any discussion using sources and methods uh, that are available to our intelligence agencies uh, if we're going to be successful. Uh, that's the world these folks operate in. And uh, so it's going to be vital for us to, uh, to use any means at our disposal, at our disposal basically, to, uh, to achieve our objective. There have been restrictions placed on the United States intelligence gathering, a reluctance to use unsavory characters, those who violated human rights, to assist in intelligence gathering. Will we lift some of those restrictions? Well, I think so. I think uh, the, um, one of the byproducts, if you will, of uh, this uh, tragic set of circumstances is that we'll see a a very thorough sort of reassessment of how we operate and the kinds of people we deal with. There's, if, if you're going to deal only with um, uh, sort of uh, officially approved, certified good guys, uh, you're not going to find out what the bad guys are doing. You need to be able to penetrate uh, these organizations. You need to have on the payroll some very unsavory characters if, in fact, you're going to be able to, to learn uh, all that needs to be learned in order to forestall these kinds of activities. Uh, it is a mean, nasty, dangerous, uh, dirty business out there, and we have to operate in that arena. Uh, I'm convinced we can do it. We can do it successfully, but we need to make certain that we have not tied the hands, if you will, of our intelligence communities uh, in terms of uh, uh, 
accomplishing their mission. These terrorists play by a whole set of different rules. It's going to force us, in your words, to get mean, dirty, and nasty mm -hmm. in order to take them on. Right. And they should realize there will be more than simply a pinprick bombing. Yeah, they, I think it's um, the, the thing that I sense, and of course now it's only been a, a few days, but I have never seen such a determination on the part of, uh, well, my colleagues in government and the part of the American people and the part of our friends and allies overseas, and even on the part of some who are not ordinarily deemed friends of the United States, um, determined in this particular instance to, uh, to shift uh, and not be uh, tolerant any longer of uh, these kinds of actions or activities. Even if we take out Osama bin Laden, that will not stop terrorism? No. No, he's, uh, he's the target of the moment, but um, I don't want to, uh, to convey the impression that somehow, uh, you know, if we had his head on a platter today, that that would solve the problem. It won't. You've got this organization, as I say, called Al-Qaeda. So, uh, somebody described it the other day as a, it's like an Internet chat room. Uh, the people who come and participate in it, uh, for one reason or another, engage in terrorism, they have sometimes different... Uh, uh, motives and ideologies, but the, the tactics they use, the way they operate, their targets, uh, uh, that'll continue until we go out basically and make the world unsafe for terrorists. And that's uh, a key part of the strategy in terms of working aggressively uh, with those nations that have previously provided uh, support and sustenance and sanctuary uh, to see to it that they no longer do that. You wouldn't mind having his head on a platter? I would uh, take it today. Saddam Hussein, your old friend. His government had this to say, the American cowboy is rearing the fruits of crime against humanity. If we determine that Saddam Hussein is also harboring terrorists, and there's a track record there, would we have any reluctance of going after Saddam Hussein? No. Do we have evidence that he's harboring terrorists? Um, there is, uh, uh, in, the, in the past, there have been some activities uh, related to terrorism by uh, Saddam Hussein. But uh, at this stage, uh, um, you know, the focus is over here on al-Qaeda and uh, the most recent events in, in New York. Saddam Hussein's bottled up at this point, but um, uh, clearly we continue to have uh, um, fairly tough policy where the Iraqis are concerned. Too. Do we have any evidence linking Saddam Hussein or Iraqis to this operation? No. Let me turn to the events of Tuesday. Where were you when you first learned a plane had struck the World Trade Center? Well, I was in my office uh, Tuesday morning. Monday, I'd been in Kentucky, and the president had been in the White House. Tuesday, our roles were sort of reversed. He was in Florida, and I was in the White House uh, Tuesday morning. And a little before 9, my uh, speechwriter came in. We were going to go over some uh, speeches coming up. And my secretary uh, called in just as we were starting to meet, just before 9 o'clock, and said an airplane had hit the World Trade Center. That was the first one that went in. So we turned on the television and watched for a few minutes and then actually saw the second plane hit uh, the World Trade Center. And um, the, uh, as soon as that second plane showed up, that's what triggered the thought terrorism. Uh, you sensed it immediately. immediately. This is deliberate. Yeah. Then uh, uh, I convened in my office. Condi Rice came down. Her office is right near mine there in the West Wing. The uh, National Security Advisor. National Security Advisor. My chief of staff, Scooter Libby, Mary Madeline, who works for me, uh, convened in my office. And we started talking about the, getting the counterterrorism task force up and operating. I talked with the president. I'd given word to Andy Card's staff, who's right next door, to get hold of, uh, of Andy and or the president. And, and uh, then I wanted to talk to him as soon as they could hook it up. This call came in, and uh, the president knew at this point about that. We discussed uh, a statement that he might make, and the first statement he made describing this as an act of apparent terrorism flowed out of uh, those conversations. While I was uh, there over the next several minutes watching developments on television, and as we started to get organized to, uh, to figure out what to do, my uh, Secret Service agents came in, and uh, they... Uh, under these circumstances, they just move. They don't say, sir, or uh, uh, ask politely. They uh, came in and said, sir, we have to leave immediately, and grabbed me. and, and, uh, and Literally grabbed you and moved you? Yeah. And uh, they were, uh, you know, your feet touched the floor periodically, but uh, they're bigger than I am, and they hoisted me up and moved me very rapidly down the hallway, down some stairs, through some doors, and down some more stairs into an underground facility under the, the uh, White House. 
and uh, it's, it's a, in effect a corridor uh, locked at both ends and uh, they did that because uh, they'd received a report that an airplane was headed for the White House. This is Flight 77, Turned which had left Dulles. Flight 77. It left Dulles, flown west towards Ohio, been captured by the terrorist. Uh, they turned off the transponder, which led to a later report that a plane had gone down in Ohio. But it really hadn't, of course. And then they turned back and headed back towards Washington. As best uh, we can tell, uh, they came initially at the White House. And uh, the plane actually circled the White House. Didn't circle it, but was headed on a track into it. The Secret Service has an arrangement with the FAA. They op had open lines after the uh, World Trade Center. Was Tracking there. it by radar. And uh, when it entered the, the danger zone and looked like it was headed for the White House, was when they grabbed me and evacuated me to the basement. Um, the plane obviously didn't hit the White House. Turned away and and we think flew a circle and came back in and then hit the Pentagon. And uh, that's what the radar track looks like. The um, uh, result of that, once I got down into the shelter, uh, the first thing I did, there's a secure phone there, first thing I did was pick up the telephone and call the president again, who was uh, still down in Florida at that point, and uh, strongly urged him to delay his return. That we you told him to stay away from Washington. I said, delay your return. Uh, we don't know what's going on here, but it looks like, uh, you know, we've been targeted. And um, Why did you make that judgment? Well, uh, it goes to... You know, my, sort of my basic role as vice president is to worry about presidential succession. I mean, my job, above all other things, is to be prepared to take over if something happens to the president. But over the years, from my time with President Ford, as Secretary of Defense, and the Intel Committee, and so forth, I've been involved in a number of programs that were aimed at ensuring presidential succession. Uh, we did a lot of planning during the Cold War, Tim, uh, with respect to the possibility of a nuclear incident. And one of the key requirements always is to protect the presidency. It's not about George Bush or Dick Cheney. It's about the, the occupant of the office. And uh, one of the things that we did later on that day were tied directly to guaranteeing presidential succession and, and that the, the, our enemies, whoever they might be, could not decapitate the federal government and leave us leaderless in a moment of crisis. It's why, for example, when we have a State of the Union speech and we've got the entire government assembled, president, vice president, congressional leaders, cabinet, and so forth. We always leave a cabinet member out. It's always taken to a secure location and set up there in case something should happen in the House chamber so we still have a president. Did uh, you have any role in Speaker Hastert, Speaker of the House, yes. being taken we, away? Uh, we evacuated Speaker Hastert to a secure facility and later the rest of the congressional leadership. I also ordered the evacuation of cabinet members, and so we sent Tommy Thompson and Venom and Gail Norton also up to a secure facility. And uh, in the days since, we've always maintained to say, I've spent a good deal of my time up at Camp David since the president returned to the White House, just so that we weren't both together in the same place, so we could ensure the survival of the government. Now, the president was, was um, on Air Force One. We received a threat to Air Force One. Uh, came a credible threat service. to Air Force One. You're well, convinced of that? I'm convinced of that. Um, now, it, you know, it may have been phoned in by a crank, but in the midst of what was going on, there was no way... Uh, to know that. Uh, I think it was a credible threat, uh, enough for the Secret Service to bring it to me. Once I left that, that uh, immediate shelter after I talked to the President urged him to stay away for now, well, I went down into what's called a PIOC, the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, and uh, there I had Norm Mineta, uh, Secretary, Secretary of Transportation, Transportation, access to the FAA, I had Condi Rice with me and several of my key staff people. We had uh, access, uh, secure communications with Air Force One, with uh, Secretary of Defense over in the Pentagon. Um, we had also the uh, secure video conference that ties together the White House, CIA, State, Justice, Defense. Um, a very useful and valuable facility. We had the counterterrorism task force up on that net. And uh, so I was in a position uh, to be able to, to see all the stuff coming in, receive reports, and then make decisions uh, in terms of acting with it. But when I arrived there, within a short order, we had word the Pentagon's been hit. Uh, we had word that the State Department had been bombed, that a car bomb had gone off at the State Department. It turned out not to be true, but we didn't know that. We had a report uh, that Norm had provided that there were six airplanes that might have been hijacked. And that's what we started working off of, was that list of six. Now, we could account for two of them in New York. The third one, we didn't know what had happened to. It turned out it had hit the Pentagon. But the first reports on the Pentagon attack uh, suggested a helicopter, and then later a private jet. And it was only after we got hold of some eyewitnesses that we knew it was an American Airlines flight. So then we had three planes accounted for, but we still had three outstanding. 
we had reports of planes down in Ohio, turned out not to be true, down in Pennsylvania, turned out that was true. And uh, <coughs> all of that, excuse me, added with the, uh, the report of a prospective attack on Air Force One itself, uh, uh, we'd have been absolute fools not to go into button-down mode, make sure we had the successors evacuated, make sure the president was safe and secure, off it was a good location for that purpose, and also in Nebraska. In Nebraska. Are you convinced there were only four hijackings, that there were not other hijackings attempted that we don't know about? I don't know. I, I, we know there were four, of course. Um, I don't think until we've completed our investigation, looked at all the ties and relationships, we'll be able to say that there were no other plans uh, for additional plans. When you made the recommendation to the president, stay where you are, go to a secure facility in Nebraska, were you ever concerned that it ever enter your thought process that there would be criticism of the president for not coming back to Washington during a crisis? Um, I, did, I, I didn't really think about it. I mean, it, it was such a clear-cut case, uh, in my estimation, that uh, the most important thing here is to preserve the presidency. We don't know what's happening. We know Washington's under attack. We don't know by who. We don't know how many additional uh, planes are coming. We don't know what all uh, is planned for us at that point. Within about uh, 35 or 40 minutes, we'd seen uh, this unfolding of this uh, monstrous terrorist attack. And uh, it was absolutely the right decision. I have no qualms about it at all. The president wanted to come back. <coughs> we talked um, repeatedly during the course of the day. Um, he made it clear he wanted back as soon as uh, we thought it made sense. The Secret Service did not want him back. Uh, they, they even talked to me, um, to try to get me to evacuate a couple of times, but I didn't want to leave the, the node that we'd established there in terms of having all of this uh, uh, capability tied together by communications where we could, in fact, make decisions and, and act. And if I'd left, gotten on a helicopter and, and uh, launched out of the White House, all of that would have been broken down. And we had uh, the presidential succession pretty well guaranteed, so I, I thought it was appropriate for me to stay in the White House. Symbolisms are so important to terrorists. The fact that George Bush stayed at the White House, you came to Camp David. Are you concerned that that sends a mixed message to the terrorists that they could disrupt their government? Or do you err on the side of caution and safety and keep the two key leaders separated? Well, we, uh, we erred on the side of, uh, I'd say, responsibility. Uh, the uh, the, the when something like this happens, you've got certain obligations and responsibilities you've got to carry out. And uh, those took priority. They did for the president. They did for me. Also with modern communications, I mean, the president was in touch with me throughout the day. We talked repeatedly. Uh, he made some key decisions that were very important to the operation. Once he got to off it, he convened a meeting of the National Security Council, again, using the secure video conference hookup. And um, What's so the most important decision you think he made during the course of the day? Well, the, um, I suppose the toughest decision was this question of whether or not we would intercept uh, incoming commercial aircraft. And uh, you decided? We decided to do it. Um, we'd, in effect, put a, um, a flying combat air patrol up over the city, F-16s, with an AWACS, which is an airborne radar system, and uh, tanker support so they could stay up a long time. Uh, doesn't do any good to put up... Uh, combat air patrol if you don't give them instructions uh, to act if, in fact, they, uh, they feel it's appropriate. So if the United States government became aware that a hijacked commercial airline was destined for the White House or the Capitol, we would take the plane down? Yes. The president made the decision on my recommendation as well, uh, wholeheartedly concurred in the decision he made, that if uh, the plane uh, would not divert, uh, if they wouldn't pay any attention to uh, instructions to, to move away from the city, uh, as a last resort, our pilots were authorized to take them out. Now, people say, you know, that's a horrendous decision to make. Well, it is. You've got an airplane full of American citizens, civilians, uh, captured by hostages, uh, ca captured by terrorists, headed, uh, and are you going to, in fact, shoot it down, obviously, and kill all those Americans on board? And you have to ask yourself, if we had had combat air patrol up over New York, and we'd had the opportunity to take out the two aircraft to hit the World Trade Center, would we have been justified in doing it? I think absolutely we would have. Now, it turned out we did not have to execute on that uh, authorization. Uh, but there were some, a few moments when we thought we might, when planes were incoming and we didn't know uh, uh, whether or not they were a problem aircraft until they diverted and gone elsewhere and, and been able to And that will be the policy of the United States in the future? Well, the president will, I'm sure, make a decision uh, uh, if those circumstances arise again. It's a presidential-level decision, and the president uh, made, I think, exactly the right call in this case to say, I wished we'd had combat air patrol up over New York. 
More and more, Mr. Vice President, we're finding out, it appears, that the fourth plane that crashed in Pennsylvania crashed because of some real heroism by Americans. Uh, Jeremy Glick had received a foot, called his wife to say he'd been hijacked. She informed him that two planes had struck the World Trade Center, and he said, I think we have to do something. That's true. Um, I, think the, um, I think the Washington part of the attack was significantly interfered with. Um, I'm, I'm speculating. Some of this is informed speculation. Some of it's based on some evidence. But clearly, we know the plane that crashed outside Pittsburgh was headed for Washington. Uh, we know it was part of the, the scheme. Uh, Mr. Glick and others, Mr. Burnett, were, were very courageous when they made that decision, knowing that, uh, that they were doomed. And you've uh, told his wife that, haven't you? I called Mrs. Glick yesterday, as a matter of fact. I haven't been able to reach Mrs. Burnett yet, but I want to call her, too. And I'm sure there were probably others on the aircraft who helped. But uh, what they did was defoil, uh, I think, the attack on Washington. My guess is, speculation, that uh, target probably would have been the Capitol building. It's big. It's easy to hit. I think one of the reasons that uh, the White House did not get hit, I think it turned out to be tougher to see than they had anticipated. When you come in from the west, as American 77 did, um, unless you get up the altitude away, you can't see the White House because the executive office building is there. And Treasury on the other side. Treasury on the other side. And I'm speculating that, that um, the lack of ability to be able to acquire it visually may, in fact, have led them to go back. Gave it up as a target and went to the Pentagon, which is clearly visible. And that's speculation on my part. We'll never know for sure. But without question, the, the um, attack would have been much worse if it hadn't been for the courageous acts of those, uh, those individuals on uh, United 93. Two important symbols. Should the World Trade Center be rebuilt? I think we clearly want to uh, redevelop that area, exactly what it, ought to, uh, what it ought to look like and what it'll go in there. Those are decisions that are going to have to be made by, uh, by New York officials. But the President's very interested in supporting uh, those efforts, and uh, I'm absolutely convinced uh, that uh, that's the right thing to do. We don't let uh, terrorists uh, prevail in this day and age. Should Ronald Reagan National Airport be reopened? We've got to find uh, ways to, uh, to deal with that problem. Um, it's been controversial from time to time over the years, but of course we've always kept Reagan open because of its location. It's very convenient for people living in Washington. The problem we have is, of course, that on the approach uh, or takeoff from, from Reagan, you fly uh, right up the Potomac and uh, you're within seconds or a minute or two of being able to hit the White House, the Congress, uh, important facilities in Washington, and uh, finding a way to deal with those circumstances is going to have to uh, precede, I think, a reopening of the airport. So it may be closed for some time. We don't know yet. I mean, Norm Manetta is working aggressively on this, and uh, but we did, uh, especially this week, we wanted to be super cautious. Uh, as long as there was the possibility there might be other teams out there that, uh, uh, in fact, plan the same kind of operation that uh, the uh, terrorist undertook on Tuesday, uh, we thought it was prudent to keep it closed for now. Mr. Vice President, we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more of our discussion of Vice President Dick Cheney. We're at Green Top in the shadows of Camp David. We'll be right back. And we are back talking to Vice President Dick Cheney. He's been here at Camp David speaking with the President and the security team for the last 36 hours at least. Mr. Vice President, a lot of discussion as to our preparedness. The first hijacking was confirmed at 820. The Pentagon was struck at 940. And yet it seems we are not able to scramble fighter jets in time to protect the Pentagon and perhaps even more than that. There have been at least five serious reports on domestic terrorism, how to cope with it. One given to you in May, Cheney to lead anti-terrorism plan. Were we ready for this? Uh, were we ready for it? Um, I think the, the agencies responded very well once it happened. I think the, uh, the courage and the bravery of uh, the men and women of New York's, for example, uh, the first responders, if you will, fire and rescue teams, many of whom gave their lives when the, uh, the towers collapsed. Uh, was superb. I don't think you take anything away from them. But uh, the, the problem we have here, I mean, if you think about it from the standpoint of aircraft, do we train our pilots to shoot down commercial airliners filled with American civilians? No. That's not a mission they've ever been given before. Now we've got to think about that. With respect to the intelligence area, there'll be, uh, I'm sure, a lot of um, sort of Monday morning quarterbacking, second guessing, if you will, about whether or not there was an intelligence failure. Clearly, we did not learn of this operation, or we would have stopped it if we had. But I think it's important to remember that our men and women in the intelligence business out there all over the world, uh, 
365 days a year defending and protecting us, oftentimes very successful, oftentimes in ways we can never talk about. Um, but uh, we clearly need to do everything we can to, to forestall those kinds of activities by improving our intelligence capabilities, and this offers a lot of lessons learned. At the same time, the, the key, though, to, is to go eliminate the terrorists. Uh, we, we may never have 100 percent perfection in terms of our intelligence capabilities to, to be able to penetrate and, and know about all of these kinds of operations. Timothy McVeigh, for example, in Oklahoma City. But uh, if we go after the terrorists, if we deny them sanctuary, if we take out uh, their bases and their, uh, their locations where they operate, uh, that's probably the most effective way to deal with this threat. But we have to recognize, no matter how good we are, no matter how aggressively we pursue this, we're likely to be subject to that, partly by the very nature of our society. We're an open uh, society. We love it that way. That's very important to preserve that and not to let the terrorists win by turning ourselves into some kind of police state. The chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee said this is a failure of great dimension in terms of intelligence. Will George Tenet remain as director of the CIA? I think George clearly should remain as director of the CIA. I think I have great, great confidence in him. I've watched him operate now uh, and work closely with him the last seven or eight months. Uh, I think he and his people do superb work for us, and uh, I think it would be a, a tragedy if uh, somehow we were to go back now in the search for scapegoats and, and say uh, that uh, uh, George Tenet or any other official ought to be uh, eliminated at this point. I don't think he can say that. When Air Force One returned to Washington, we saw it accompanied by fighter jets. Right. General Norman Schwarzkopf, a man you know well, has suggested that perhaps in the short term at least, Air Force One should be accompanied by fighter jets while flying over the United States just as a precaution? Uh, perhaps. Um, I don't know that we've made that judgment yet, that decision yet. Um, you know, what happened on Tuesday, of course, once we got all the aircraft grounded, that gave us a fairly high degree of confidence that we, we were in control. The problem was there were some 2,000 aircraft up when, when the, this operation started, and it took several hours to get them all down. And as long as there were aircraft up and there was a report of a threat against Air Force One and there were aircraft we couldn't account for that might in fact have been taken by the terrorists, uh, flying cover for Air Force One was very important. Would we consider using fighter jets to protect Air Force One for the I, short? I think if we believe it's necessary, we absolutely will. In Europe, the government provides security at the airports. Highly trained, well-paid specialists. Here in the United States, it's a low-paying job hired by the airlines. Would we consider having the government take over airline security, airport security? We're clearly going to have to look at this whole question and, and find ways to improve and enhance our security, uh, without doubt. I and mean, it's going to be a prime focus for Norm Manette and the folks over at the FAA. Exactly what the answer ought to be, Tim, I don't, uh, don't have enough information now to be able to judge that. But uh, without question, this was a significant uh, uh, failure there in the sense that they were able to take for, for uh, Aircraft, But again, they did it. They didn't do it with guns or explosives. They did it with knives. The airline industry is losing $300 million a day, several teetering on uh, bankruptcy or at least Chapter 11. Would you support a federal bailout of both loans and grants and assistance to the airline industry? Uh, the uh, president hasn't really taken a position on any particular piece of legislation. I think we're, we're very interested in finding ways to make certain that um, in this particular instance there's no sort of permanent damage, if you will, will to our civil aviation uh, uh, capacity. It's very important. We've got people, Norman Ed is working on it, Larry Lindsay, who heads the Economic Council, is heavily engaged in it. We're working with the airlines, and I'm sure we'll come up with So you're open to the yes. concept? Absolutely. About a week ago, we were all discussing the so-called Social Security Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. And the who's lock box. And the lockbox. Right. And who spent the surplus. Is that debate now moot? I think so. I certainly hope so. I think... Um, you know, we've all been concerned to make certain we protect Social Security, uh, but we clearly have a situation here, and, and, and the, that debate was a, a little bit fallacious anyway, because, in fact, uh, there was never any question about what the United States government was going to pay its obligations to our seniors. That we've never defaulted on a debt since Alexander Hamilton was Treasury Secretary, so that's never really been an issue. But clearly at this stage, we do have a surplus that's generated primarily by the payroll tax, and uh, as has been true oftentimes in the past, that comes in. Uh, we were using it to retire debt. Clearly some of it now is going to be used to meet this emergency. The urgent supplemental that Congress passed this weekend of some $40 billion take those steps we need to take, both to recover from this attack as well as to do everything we can to prevent future ones. The president said he would use the Social Security surplus in case of war and or recession. Right. 
Do we now have both war and recession? Uh, quite possibly. We clearly have a war uh, against terrorism. And uh, we don't know yet what the uh, third quarter is going to be like. But if the economists come in and, and revise the second quarter down into negative territory in terms of uh, gross domestic product growth, and the third quarter, fourth, fourth quarter, the third quarter of the calendar year, fourth quarter. And the economic year. shock from this. Yeah. If that comes in negative, then we'll have the definition to a negative quarters. That would qualify as a recession. What about the debate over missile defense? Many Democrats are saying this now proves that our focus should be on terrorism and counterterrorism and preparedness and that the primary threat is not something the missile defense could take care of. Well, I just <clears throat> fundamentally disagree. I mean, there's no question about what there's a threat on the terrorist front. And... Um, uh, we've got to deal with that. We've been working it. We'll continue to work it. But there also that this does not in any way diminish the threat with respect to ballistic missiles down the down the road. A, a ballistic missile equipped with a weapon of mass destruction, a nuke, for example, a nuclear weapon, uh, would be far more devastating than what we just went through. Uh, if one of those was to hit one of our cities, um, or uh, to hit a uh, major base overseas where U.S. forces are deployed. Uh, the casualty list would be higher. The consequences would be even greater than the, the terrible tragedy we've just been through. So we can afford this war on terrorism and a missile defense system? I don't see, Tim, how anybody can argue that we cannot afford to defend America. And we're going to have to defend it against uh, conventional threats. We're going to have to defend it against ballistic missile threats. We're going to have to defend it against the threat of terrorism. And uh, I think for public officials to argue because we got hit with a terrorist assault, uh, uh, we should ignore the uh, ballistic missile threat out there strikes me as, as irresponsible. The stock market has been closed since Tuesday. It reopens tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned? I think uh, that our economy is strong. Um, I uh, do believe the market's going to open tomorrow. That's uh, clearly the current plan and expectation. Uh, I would hope... Uh, I'm, I'm not an investor anymore because I had to uh, get out of the market since I'm now a public official. But I would hope the American people would, uh, in effect, stick their thumb in the eye of the terrorist and, and uh, say that they've got great confidence in the country, great confidence in our economy, and not let uh, what's happened here in any way uh, throw off uh, their normal level of economic activity. We look forward to recovery later this year from the slowdown period that we've been through, and uh, I have every confidence that, uh, that that will, in fact, happen. Would you ever consider undoing or holding off or triggering part of the tax cut in the future if the resources were necessary? No, I think the, uh, I think the tax cut's crucial. And uh, that's exactly what we needed in terms of the slowdown. Um, having the tax cut out there now means we're going to have a more robust year than would have been the case without the tax cut. Uh, it's a key piece of um, stimulus. And uh, I think the president did exactly the right thing. There is such fervor, such emotion such anger in the country right now. And as we conduct this war against terrorism, as you said, it's going to take days, months, years. What do we ask of the American people? Will they have to sacrifice in order to help win this war? I guess I would ask vigilance. Um, be aware of what's going on around you. Uh, don't operate on the assumption that somehow because we live behind two oceans, uh, we're immune to, to attack. We now know we're not. Um, I would ask, uh, obviously, that uh, they be uh, understanding, if you will, of uh, the importance of the effort that we're going to have to undertake here. We may end up, you know, with more uh, stringent security measures at airports and things like that. But I think there's a, a unity and a spirit out there that I have not seen for a long time in this country. I see it on Capitol Hill between Republicans and Democrats. I see it um, the workers who were uh, cleaning up uh, the mess uh, in New York where the president visited yesterday. I see it in the people I've talked with, and I think uh, we have to recognize we are the strongest, most powerful nation on earth. Uh, we've got a tremendous uh, set of accomplishments and an enormously bright future ahead of us. There are those in the world who hate us, and they will do everything they can to impose pain, and we can't let them win. And we'll find them. We'll find them. Mr. Vice President, we thank you for inviting us up to the mountains here with you, and uh, we'll be watching you very carefully. Thanks, Tim. Like all of you, I've spent this week wiping my eyes and grinding my teeth and wondering why. I've drawn strength from a story about a man I knew, Father Michael Judge, the chaplain of the New York City Fire Department, a Franciscan. He raced to the World Trade Center after the explosion to comfort the injured. While administering the last rites to a dying rescue worker, he himself was killed by flying debris. New York's bravest physically carried Father Mike away. They brought his body first to the altar of St. Peter's Church, 
where it would be safe. Then to their firehouse on 31st Street, hook and ladder company number 24, directly across from the friary where he lived. They wrapped him in sheets and placed him in one of their own bunks. They asked his fellow Franciscans to cross the street and join them. Together, firemen, priests, and brothers wept and sang the prayer of St. Francis. May the Lord bless and keep you and show his face to you and have mercy on you. That is the way of New York. That is the spirit of America. From February 1945 at Iwo Jima to September 2001 at the World Trade Center.